Hi, everybody. My name's Terry. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Terry. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight and uh, letting me share some experience, strength, and hope with you all. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Well, um, I was taught that a speaker's meeting like this, we're supposed to uh, basically say what it was like, uh, what happened, and what I'm like now. Um, and I'm supposed to do that in 15 minutes, so this is going to be a hit and run. <laughs> Buckle up, here we go. Um, my sobriety date is uh, July 29 of 2018. I actually uh, feel a lot of gratitude uh, in that I have uh, celebrated 2,000 days yesterday, <laughs> which is cool. Um, before finding AA five and a half years ago, um, 12 days was my all-time record for stringing sober days together, and they were 12 absolutely miserable days. Um, so again, really grateful for this program. Um, so what it was like. Um, I don't have a lot of fun drunk log stories. Uh, for me, it was miserable. That pretty much sums it up. Um, you know, I've been taught we don't spend a lot of time in speakers meetings um, going over and, and glorifying um, our escapades, and that was really easy for me because I, I, I isolated, um, I was miserable, um, I drank away friends, a marriage, um, a business. Um, I got to a point where I felt hopeless and worthless. That's really what it comes down to. Um, I, uh, my, my disease progressed like most of ours do. Uh, when I came in <clears throat> to my first meeting five and a half years ago at the Lingwood Alano Club, uh, I'd just been uh, given walking papers, told to pack a bag and didn't care where I was going, just not staying here. Uh, no one's heard that story before. Mm -hmm. But um, I ended up at the Lumina Lotto Club, and um, I, uh, I received a wonderful gift that day. Uh, it's called the gift of desperation. Uh, there's a person in this room who I met my first week <clears throat> who uh, used to smile and just giggle and say, you have a chance, you might make it here because you really seem to have that gift of desperation. And of all the human beings I've met in the last decade or so, no one did I want to punch in the face more than that. <laughs> uh, and he's here now, and he's going to get a, a, an uncomfortably lingering hug after he moves. So. Because <laughs> he was right. Uh, it's, it's what I needed. Um, so, yeah, the, the solution for me, what happened? What happened was I got that gift of desperation, and it was a gift. Um, I'm somebody who I won't change if I don't feel pain. That's all there is to it. And my drinking progressed over the years. Uh, you know, the last year and a half or so, um, you know, I was blacking out or passing out um, or just flaming out every night, uh, every single night. And um, <clears throat> when I had that first meeting at the Lingwood Alano Club, um, I'd had a little bit to drink that morning, but only a little. So by um, three o'clock when I hit that first meeting, I was sweating and shaking. And of course, I was crying and I was a total train wreck. Um, but I sat in that meeting because I had nowhere else to go, no, no, no idea what to expect. And uh, a couple of people got up and shared their stories. It was a, a podium meeting. So uh, AA Q&A, um, an old guy named George uh, used to run that. And uh, the first couple of people who went up to that podium and shared, I mean, they told my story. They told about lying to their spouses and children and hiding their alcohol um, abuse and, you know, ruining marriages and, and you know, feeling despicable. But... Um, they both also talked about how after a number of years, they'd gotten, you know, the relationships back with those family members and that they were happy, which just blew my mind. You know, these people drank like me uh, and they were happy and they were productive. And um, I was in awe. I had no idea that it was possible. Um, so the, I was called on the third person and, uh, at that meeting. And um, I'm a pretty private person. I don't share my garbage, especially with, you know, my ego is way too, too too happy and robust to share my crap with anybody else. So um, I was just shocked to see myself go up to that podium and I shared deeply. Uh, you know, I was, again, I was bawling and, and talking about how I'd been lying and, and it, all this horrible stuff I'd been doing and how you know, my kids would probably never speak to me again and I was gonna move into my, my truck because I didn't deserve to live anywhere else. So I, I was, you know, full on into pity party misery, but I, I shared all that stuff. Um, I shared that I'd been drinking alcoholically for maybe a year and a half, maybe, maybe even, yeah, probably a year, year and a half. And I believed it. And I felt so good about sharing that. Uh, and um, 
you know, it's funny, I sobered up and 30, 60 days later, something like that, I realized it'd been a little longer. It was probably more like two, two and a half uh, decades, not years. <laughs> yeah, it had been a, a very, very long time in coming. And, um, you know, that's, that pretty much sums up my alcoholism. I mean, you know, 20, 20 or 25 years ago, uh, I remember thinking, you know, I'm only drinking until I pass out three or four days a week. I'm going to keep that to three because that's less than half. If I'm only passing out at night or blacking out half the time, I'm probably okay. And so I know my alcoholism goes back at least you know, 20 years. Um, and I had a lot of other behaviors that were like that. But um, this, this, everybody I talk to who's been around for a while um, tells me the same story. Um, our, our disease progresses. Um, and um, mine certainly did. At the end there, I was drinking <clears throat> obscene quantities, totally isolating. Um, you know, every night was a blackout or a, a pass out. And... Um, uh, you know, I had no hope left. I, I was I was ready to, to turn it all in. So having that event, uh, getting kicked out and having no place to go and, and nothing to do, um, it, it really saved my life. Because it, it gave me a few gifts. Well, first of all, it, it, it allowed me to accept what was going on with my life. It was, I needed that pain so I could make some change. And uh, at that first meeting, that old guy, after the meeting, I grabbed this big book and he was shaking it in my face and saying, that answer to all your problems, it's right here in this book right here and you can't effing read it um he basically told me that i had to find a sponsor to read me that book um, because if i did it myself like everything else in my life i would screw it up and he was 100 percent right so i went to two other meetings that night um, i found somebody um, at the speakers meeting that night who offered to sponsor me and i started working with them the next day and a whole chain of gifts um, presented themselves um, uh, a bunch of epiphanies um, you know, it started off pretty simple. Um, you know, I, I found that sponsor and he, <clears throat> he took me to meetings all over town. Um, when I got there, you know, I, I felt worthless and incapable of, of even being a human being. Um, but I still had some ego, that, you know, it was that stereotypical e egomaniac with severe self-esteem issues, right? I was that stereotype. Um, so he, he took me to some pretty egg-heady meetings, you know, pretty, you know, silly superficial stuff you know he took me to some of the fancy meetings over on the east side he took me to some first spiritual meetings which i hated because i i came in a pretty pretty uh, how do i want to put this um i was terribly atheistic we'll, just, we'll, we'll leave it at that i have a nickname that i won't i won't uh, use here for recording but um i was terribly atheistic so he he took me to all the meetings that he thought i might like and to some that were terrifying he, he took me to fremont on a friday night and you know uh, i was afraid to get out of the car and everything in between but that was a, it, was a, it was a wonderful gift um he let me know that no matter what i need this program it was there for me um and uh, you know from there it just the gifts went on and on um you know, that, that sponsor helped me with, uh, you know, accepting my lot, um, that, that gift of desperation, you know, one of our acronyms for God, um, that really helped me with this program, it helped me with acceptance. Um, I learned a lot of lessons along the way that um, also saved my life. Um, around 30 days in, I think it was, I think it was on my 28th or 29th day, uh, the topic at uh, one of my meetings was uh, service. You know, we all have these coins, or most of us have coins in our pockets or, or handbags. Um, they've got recovery at the base. That's what I'm looking for. I'm assuming that's what you're looking for as well. Um, and the other two sides of that triangle are um, unity and service. And the topic was about service and how it was an integral part of our programs and how it, it, the benefits were just um, unescapable. And uh, it started, started me thinking, another one of these epiphanies. Um, if I look back in my life, the times where I was happy, uh, less likely to be you know, just a drunken, useless fool, um, it's when I was doing something out in the community. You know, there was a while there where I was running a, a crew for Habitat for Humanity. Um, and I was hardly ever drunk when I did that. And, uh, you know, I did some, some, some computer training at, a, at a, a community center in South Seattle. Those times of my life, you know, thinking back, I was a happier human being. Um, it, was, it was a really significant epiphany for me. Uh, there was a reason why that's on the back of that coin and why it's one of the, you know, one of the core trinity in our program. So um, a longtime member uh, dragged me into the snooping intergroup and I started answering phones. Um, and, you know, I didn't think I was capable of that. I didn't think I was capable of anything. Um, but the environment was just so kind. Uh, the environment in AA I find so kind. I, I can take a job that I'm totally unqualified for and I will fail because I'm unqualified. And the people around me will laugh at me and they will give me a hand and they will explain it to me very kindly. 
and uh, it'll be a wonderful experience. So I, I almost relish falling on my face these days because I know it's going to be it's it's going to be not only okay, it's going to be a wonderful learning experience. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, the gifts. I won't do it in time. The gifts just they kept they kept going and going. Um, I learned about accountability. Um, I learned about a higher power, which is the, one of the trickier things for me. I, I mentioned a minute ago how I was uh, terribly atheistic when I came in. Um, and that second step in turning things over to a higher power and our third step, that was a real challenge for me. Um, but uh, I am no longer terribly atheistic. Now I'm a terrible atheist. <laughs> yeah. I think I said that right. Um, yeah, I can, I can pray these days. That was a, a hard learned skill for me. Um, and not only can I pray, but I can meditate and I, I, I feel like I'm getting answers that I wouldn't have thought of sometimes. Um, I love on awakening in the big book. Probably most of you in the room know that, that section, uh, it talks about how, uh, you know, over time that next intuitive thought is more likely to come. Um, and that, that has come to fruition for me. Um, we talked about a psychic change too. all these events. Uh, tore me down enough that I was, um, uh, well, there's another acronym, uh, WHO. It's another one of my epiphanies. You know, somebody talking about, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. It doesn't matter whether you're ready to accept all the, all, you know, all the premises of this program. All you have to be is willing, honest, and open-minded. Uh, everything else will come. If you're truly those three things, everything else will come. And, um, you know, the higher power bit for me, that, that was so true. You know, I, I beat my head on the wall for a good couple of years on making that work. And I remember specifically what seat I was sitting in at, at, at Tug, uh, my home group, um, on a Saturday morning um, when the phrase, let go, let God, came into my mind. And of all the phrases in this program, that's the one that historically has just made me want to wretch, you know, being the terrible atheist. Terrible atheistic? Anyway. Um, I just I've always hated that one. And I remember sitting there and it just finally sinking in what that meant for me. And I was again, sitting there quietly in tears while the rest of the meeting was wondering what the hell's going on with Terry. Um, but it occurred to me that, um, if I just, when something I dislike happens or something that I, I, I title as terrible happens or, you know, whatever, something unsavory. Um, if I just do nothing, if I just quiet my mind, pray for direction. And perhaps later in the day, meditate on what that thing was that was so horrific. 80% of the time, it just goes away. It either wasn't a problem in the first place, I was making it a problem, or the universe fixes it for me. But um, if I can just let go and let God not just react negatively as a default to everything that goes on in my life, so many of my problems, they just go away. Um, and that's, that's a psychic change that I never would have dreamed of. I mean, that, that's a life changer for me. Um, you know, so not only do I not feel like a hypocrite anymore when I pray, and I only pray for direction these days. Uh, last thing I prayed for was health, and I got heart failure for it, and <laughs> it took me nine months to dig myself out of that. It worked. It, it got me the, the goal I was looking for, but um, I, pray, I pray for direction these days, and, um, and that's pretty much it. Pray for direction, and then I try to meditate and listen for answers. Um, but that, that different way of living life now, you know, not having all those expectations for everything, you know, I have a way I want things done. I'm a control freak. You know, I am that that actor play director. I want to control every one of you, and then you are going to do it the way I want, and you're going to I'm going to, you're going to piss me off, and it's going to be sorry, it's going to be a mess. That's how I roll. Um, and you know, it's not so much these days. I, I catch myself and I redirect that very quickly these days. And um, since I'm about out of time, how it is now? I've already started the how it is now. Um, this program, it's changed everything. That default thought is not the same anymore. My default thought is usually I'm uncomfortable. Well, I'm going to go call somebody and talk to them. I'm going to call somebody that I haven't heard from for a while or somebody that I know is suffering and I'm going to help them out. Um, and then whatever's bothering me usually goes away. And that, you know, that let go, that God, that 80%, it's gone. Um, you know, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Life still happens. I've actually probably had more loss in my, you know, bona fide loss in my life in the last year, five years than I've had in the 20 before, you know, marriages and lost siblings and all those things. But, um, you know, I've actually experienced them. Um, I felt them and lived through them and worked through them and gotten help from people around me. And um, it's just, it, life is just so different now. And uh, it's, it's so much better. Um, I have so many people around me that I care about and care about me. You know, I don't have enough time in my day to spend with all the people that I, I really care about. And um, 
you know, going from feeling worthless and useless and afraid to do anything in life to feeling, um, you know, if I had any stress these days, it's that, oh, I see 10 people in the room right now that I haven't gotten to talk to enough in the last two weeks and feeling guilty about that. That's the stress I have in my life these days. So um, it's really a beautiful thing. I'm so grateful for this program and uh, for being here. Thanks, Terry. Thanks. Thanks.